God is not goodness or rationality or power. God isn't perfection. God isn't even whatever we mean when we repeat the phrase, God is love. God isn't a category. God isn't a guarantee. Omnipotence doesn't have the qualities of a formula or a mathematical problem. God is personality. God is a personality. Personality in action because of a relationship. In two weeks, when we celebrate communion and Jeff and Joe break bread, Jeff breaks bread in their home at the table, he's not going to lift up the loaf of bread and break it and say, this is omnipotence. This is perfection. Instead, he will say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. That's what he's going to say, because God is in a relationship with us. An abstract concept, even one like goodness, cannot love you. Power certainly cannot love you. But God, who comes to you and comes to us, God can love you. God went for the jugular, Paul says. God went for the jugular. When he came to us in his son, God went for the jugular. He didn't deal with the problem as something remote and abstract, something remote and unimportant. What problem? Our problem, the human problem. The fact that your greatest strength, which may well help people and has probably served you quite well, has also probably hurt the people that you love the most. That's the problem. The way we want to please God and love God and long to do that. And yet, the whole while, we hold her off and push her away and deny her reality and shove her out of the world and then turn and wonder, where are you when we need her the most? That's the problem. The fact that the first time someone said black lives matter in the pulpit of St. Paul's. It was a black man who spoke it. That's the problem. Or the fact that God chose Israel. God chose Israel as his people and then came to be with the rest of us in a Jew. And we couldn't, Christianity couldn't handle the complexity of that or the jealousy of our own feelings. And the Holocaust winds up being the result, the crucifixion writ large across our human history. That's the problem. The problem is that we are so very distant from the one who made us. The problem pains God. He loves us. He loves St. Paul's. He loves you. So he comes to us. He goes for the jugular. Who's jugular? Who's jugular? Maybe his own. Taking on the very problems I've just named, assuming the brokenness and dysfunction of the human condition, assuming whatever it is inside of you that made you snap the last time and speak rudely or angrily to someone that you really care about, or maybe even yourself, whatever it is that's going awry in our lives, whatever it is that is capable of corruption inside of us, that is what God took on the problem, our problem. That problem moves God to give himself away. Last week, last week on Saturday, I was in our sanctuary for one of the very first times since all of this began, since the pandemic began. Uh, I mean, I've certainly walked through and recorded these sermons in there occasionally, but this was the first time I was there in a worship capacity. And it was for the funeral of our dear member, Lois Stack. Funerals will always, I think, evoke something a little strange for a pastor or a rabbi or whoever's officiating at one of them because you need to be professional and you're also in grief. You need to be present. And I was, of course, present to Lois's funeral because I knew her and I cared about her. I loved her as a member of our church. I missed her. It's sad that she was dead. But I was also at the same time delighted in a strange way to be in the sanctuary again, in that beautiful room. And I was sitting up in the pulpit in a chair that we hide up there sometimes. You can't quite see it from down on the floor. I was sitting in this chair 
in order to be at a very safe distance from the very people I was called upon and am called upon to take care of, to try and soothe or to at least point toward God for the time being. There I was. I couldn't be anywhere near them. Sitting up there, and how strange that was, began to dawn upon me. And then also at the same time, I looked out and I saw amongst the people who were there, just a handful of our members, because we told everybody to stay away, really. But there they were, six of our, eight of our members, maybe. The Basils were there, Lois and Greg, Marcia and John Opp were there, Mary and Dad Brown, Ninon was there. I'm sure I'm forgetting someone, and I'm sorry, but it was sparse. Everyone doing a great job of keeping socially distant from one another. Everyone with a mask on. And I had that phenomenon happened that I think we've all probably fantasized about in this time, where I have thought at least, maybe you have, what would it be like if I woke up like, like Rip Van Winkle and stepped into 2020 right now, this moment, in this time of quarantine and pandemic? What would it be if I woke up in the grocery store and saw everybody in a mask? I had that feeling, but it actually felt like it was happening. And I looked out and I thought, what, what has happened? What has struck us? Why are there so few people in church? Where is everyone? And it looks like these eight are the only ones who survived. And we've all got masks on. It was a bizarre feeling. And then right at that same moment as I was having that feeling, Lois's son-in-law, Alexis, husband to her daughter, Amy, and their two children, twins, about, I think, nine years old, they were performing a song that Lois loved and that they loved together, the song City of New Orleans by Steve Goodman. I knew it from Bob Dylan's recording of it. It's, you've probably heard it on the radio a million times. The song has this refrain. I thought this was the title of the song. This, the refrain goes, I'll, I'll try it. Um, Good morning, America, how are you? Right? Over and over again. Kind of it starts to get a little irritating, actually. Not in the funeral, but when you hear that song on the radio. So... I'm having all these thoughts, bewildered, sad, a little grateful, but the gratitude is kind of slipping away quickly. And then there's that phrase over and over again, good morning, America, how are you? And suddenly I started weeping up there. I was hidden, but I started weeping in the pulpit, lost my professionalism. And all I could think was not well. America is not well. We've got a problem. We might be a problem. That's the problem. That's what God steps into, comes into, and solves. Solves it by taking it upon himself, by dissolving the distance between us and him, by loving us despite ourselves, by accepting us, embracing us, bringing us home, and leaving us with only one task to perform. All we have to do, as Paul Tillich said so beautifully, is accept the fact that we are accepted. All we have to do in order to be in right relationship with God is to love the fact that we're beloved. All we have to do is believe that God has brought us home by coming to our home, by coming to us, because we couldn't do it ourselves. We couldn't do it ourselves. As Karl Barth says with a sort of scary intensity, a drowning man cannot save himself by pulling himself out of the water by the scruff of his own hair if he has any. And neither can you. Neither can you. You can't bring yourself to God. Neither can your favorite way of pursuing well-being or your favorite method of surviving or having comfort or whatever it is that you do to make it seem as if all is right with existence. It doesn't work. God has done what the law, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done. When he said law, Paul was referring, of course, to the, well, the Ten Commandments expanded, right? All of the laws that ancient Israel were following together as a community, not as a group of individuals. Our obsession with individual rights was not a part of their lives. They were a people together, held together and held under the love, protection, authority, and power of their God by the law. It is what kept them in right relationship with God. And Paul comes along and says, it doesn't work, doesn't work. You can't 
think, I don't believe, I can't, of anything more offensive to say than what Paul said to those first century Jewish people, his sisters and brothers in the faith. You can't think of anything that would be more frightening to them, more maybe absurd to them, more offensive. Think of the most offensive thing you've ever heard. Think of the most pious person you know. Combine the two. That is not as offensive as Paul saying the law doesn't work. It's impossible, I think, for us to grasp the significance and the threat the offensiveness of that statement, unless unless we really listen to what he's saying, unless we are faithful or brave or foolish or maybe even desperate enough to let Christ grab us by the jugular. Because we've got the law too. Every single one of us has some kind of external system of rules and regulations, demands, and obligations, or maybe it's something we've internalized that we're trying to satisfy in order to make it seem as if all is right with the world or all is right with the inside of our own disordered selves, right? In order to take the sting out of existence. And oftentimes these methods, my law, your law, really what they do have the power to do is to help us ignore the problem, but they don't have the power to solve it. They do have the power to drive us in an unhealthy and ultimately unproductive way. I became a minister. I became a minister all these years of school, working hard. All this time, no weekends for a long time. That's one of the weird gifts of this strange quarantine is to have a weekend like the rest of the normal world, except the normal world is not so normal right now. But anyhow, everything I've done, all the good that I've done, even, all of it, all of it, I did it in order to satisfy the demands of my demanding, loving father, whose demands I wasn't able to meet when he was alive. And then he died when I was 13 years old. And then I spent so much time trying to satisfy him. How do I satisfy him? Well, I become a pastor. That's how the law drove me. My law drove me. I wasn't serving God really so much for years as I was trying to satisfy the obligations of the law that I internalized. And if you had come and said to me back when I was still subscribing to that fiction, it doesn't work. It's a hopeless exercise. What are you doing? You should have gone to law school. I would have been mightily offended. Whatever law makes you get up in the morning and work so hard It doesn't work. It's never going to bring you into right relationship with God or even take the sting out of existence. It's not going to work. When I used to be the pastor to this congregation full of extraordinarily wealthy people, I had this phenomenon happen or experienced it, saw it happen, bore witness to it, tried to minister to it at least a dozen times over the years. And it would be someone who had hit a home run in our economy, Typically, often, always actually a man, typically someone who hadn't grown up in a lot of privilege or comfort, but they'd made it. Huge house and another huge house to have vacations in. Four or five car garage and an expensive car and each one kids in grade school and enough money saved up to pay for their college. Everything worked. They had the job and the life they had dreamt of, but more importantly, the job and the life that they'd been told by the law that governed their lives in the American success economy that they had to satisfy. And then they hit this point where they realized it didn't work. They didn't feel good. They were unhappy. They still were full of longing and dissatisfaction. And they'd come to me and they'd say, what's going on? And it wasn't just depression. Sometimes it might have been and probably was depression. I'd try to find them help. But it was because the fact that the law, this thing that was driving them so hard compulsively was a lie and a fiction. And let me tell you, when I tried to speak that truth to these people, they were mightily offended. But none of it works. No matter what it is that you're doing to make yourself right with existence, it's incapable of solving the problem. It won't do it. So stop letting your internalized parent or the myth of prosperity 
or the wellness industry or your love for your own children or your drive to succeed or your own appetites. Stop letting these things be your motivation. Stop letting them drive you. Stop trying to satisfy the law because in as much as these things are promising to make your life right, they are nothing but lies. Nothing but lies driving you to satisfy the outrageous demands of an idol, a false god. Why do you get up in the morning and go to work? Well, you do that in order to make money, right? Why do you want to make money? You want to make money because, well, it can get you things. It can buy you comfort, all sorts of nice things in your life, right? I read one time that anybody who ever says it's just money is rich, but why do we want to make money? Why does that drive our economy? Well, it drives our economy. It drives our lives, I should say. It drives us because that's how we derive our self-worth. Get out and we earn it. It's why people have a hard time retiring, I think. They've been, obli they've been obligated to meet the demands of this external law of America. And then you're done. Done working. Done producing. Earning done manufacturing your own self-worth, making yourself at right with the world. What do you do then? Who are you now? I think retirement is hard. How do we know, Karl Barth said this too, how do we know that we're satisfying, or I'm sorry, how do we know that we're speaking rightly of Christ's mission to conquer sin and death? We know that we're doing it, he said, if we have mightily offended every other possible option and offended it at its most particularly tender spot. And then when we've offended everyone we're talking to about God, then we know we're doing it right. Mm, it's tough. Why so intense, right? Why does it have to be so intense? Why can't it just be pleasing and happy and beautiful? Well, because... We are addicted to idolatry. As Martin Luther said, the human mind is a factory of idols. So you got to get serious to break us loose of the false gods we're serving and the fictional laws that we're trying to satisfy. But also on the positive end, because as long as we insist on going our own way, deriving and defining our own worth, satisfying whatever law we've internalized or drives us from the outside, we prevent ourselves from receiving the beautiful gift that God is trying to give us of his very self. We prevent ourselves from realizing all is right with the world. We can live in the kingdom of heaven here on earth right now. Those moments are there for us. And so if this time ends, the pandemic ends, when it ends, it's gonna end, and I can't wait for that to happen. But if it ends, and I come out of it determined to attend twice as many church committee meetings in order to satisfy my law, then it has been for naught and for nothing. And if you come out of it determined to double down on your efforts to make things right, whatever that might be, it's been for nothing. It's been for nothing. Don't redouble your efforts. Just take your hands off the wheel. Take your hands off the wheel and simply embrace what the Spirit is doing within us. That's what Paul calls us to do. Simply embrace what the Spirit is doing within us. We have to be in it together for this to work, but the Spirit will come to us and together we'll be guided by it. Together. Right before... Well, right before that funeral, actually, Kelly and I were sitting out on the back porch of the parsonage, and the vines are up on the fence between our house and the parking lot. You can't really see what's going on there this time of year, or be seen, which can be nice. But all of a sudden, in the middle of a quiet Saturday morning, you heard this crazy sound of a toddler chortling, just <laughs> that sound that little kids make when they laugh. And he was doing it like little kids, 18 months old, diaper, barely walking, right? or walking kind of unsteadily. Couldn't see him though. I, didn't, I wasn't even sure what it was at first, but it's kind of an unmistakable sound. But the thing is, this little kid was laughing for, I, I, I'm not exaggerating, a good 15 to 20 minutes of just laughing, stop, laughing, stop, laughing. 
So eventually we got up and we had to see what it was. Kelly went first and she said, oh, you got to see this. And then I walked over and at the back of the parking lot, there's a fence on the alley and the fence has a gate that is unlocked. And the gate is probably, I think it's 12 to 15 feet high. And this little boy had a hold of it and he was opening it and closing it. And every time he opened it and every time he closed it, he would crack up. He loved the feeling of moving this gigantic piece of metal. He was simply embracing what the spirit was doing within us. And the us for him was him and his dad because his dad was letting this happen. What a loving act from that man, simply embracing what the spirit was doing. God isn't going to disappoint you. God isn't going to leave you bereft. God isn't going to let you down. The law, your law, it will ultimately, mine did. And then we can embrace what the Spirit is doing within us, but we don't have to let it happen. We don't have to be let down. We can do it now. Hallelujah. Amen.